Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening for those who are uh, in the in the southern hemisphere um, or in Australia, more precisely. Uh, here it's uh, about uh, six uh, eighteen p.m. Um, and uh, good morning uh, for those who are in Europe. And uh, I won't uh, necessarily cover all the time zones uh, in the world, but I definitely welcome you all uh, to join us in um, uh, this most uh, um, interesting uh, and privileged session uh, that we have um, uh, today. The uh, fortune of uh, and delight really to have uh, Professor Santuari uh, uh, participating to um, our uh, value health economics and policy yeah, series yeah. Uh, of seminars. Um, I would uh, uh, say that um, uh, Alcest and I uh, already go uh, back quite a while um, in uh, terms uh, of um, um, uh, acquaintance and uh, collaborations um, in the area of health economics and management. Ob obviously, uh, we, we worked uh, for many years in, in, in an indirect way. So we worked with colleagues uh, uh, of us, but, but uh, not really uh, directly. However, our uh, areas of interest uh, um, intersect in many ways, uh, and uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome him um, uh, today in uh, our session. Alceste, uh, uh, Professor Santua is uh, um, a, a professor at the University of Bologna. Um, and uh, um, his, uh, um, of course, legal background has uh, 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 made him uh, an expert in uh, a number of important um, uh, areas. And today um, he will focus on uh, social enterprises as providers of social and health services, lessons from Italy and the EU. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, people here in Newcastle uh, that are, have been uh, very interested in the, the uh, social enterprise uh, cooperative work uh, world uh, and of course work. Um, I hope um, uh, they uh, enjoy this. We had a conference earlier uh, this year. Uh, Sitzel uh, uh, Gimsel, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, she's, she's Norwegian. Um, she's um, uh, focal point in this area and uh, uh, definitely um, uh, please contact her uh, and us. Uh, obviously some um, um, let's say so, some important information for the handling of this seminar. Um, so while uh, Alcesta presents, um, I ask everybody uh, to mute themselves, uh, please, um, to uh, minimize noise. And uh, uh, we will um, collect uh, in the Q&A session uh, your, uh, uh, your questions. You can already uh, participate by uh, interactive in the chat function uh, with uh, within Zoom, uh, and uh, I uh, will uh, uh, pose the question to Alcesti. But so please um, uh, mention your name and the question, and I will uh, then uh, uh, pose it. And, and then, of course, uh, wh whether uh, the, the question requires an interaction, and uh, you uh, you unmute yourself and participate in, in that. Uh, so we have about one hour um, of time, um, um, of course, a little bit less uh, 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 given this uh, uh, rather uh, uh, long introduction, but I think it's well uh, deserved. So I'll just the floor is, is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Let me just, can you, can you see, the, can you read the slides? Yes. Like that, it's better? Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, Francesco, and I would like also to thank Marcello Antonini for his valuable technical support. And I would also greet my, my colleague and friend, Matthew Hardin, who actually pushed me to um, send in an article, which uh, later was uh, published in the Third Sector Review, which is based in Australia, actually, and uh, from, uh, from which Francesco let's say, had the idea of holding this seminar. Um, the article was, uh, is published, for those who are interested in, uh, in reading it um, fully, in volume 26, number one, published this year. Um, now, where do, we, where do we start from, or better? What is my task uh, this morning or this evening uh, given, given the time zone. 
I would like to make you realize how legal frameworks are important to support the development of a given legal, um, legal structure. Namely, uh, as far as what we are concerned today, uh, social enterprises. And also to try and highlight the importance of the peculiar character of a given uh, legal, legal form, i.e. social enterprises. But where do we start from? We need to start from saying that in Europe, we had, we've had for, for years, for decades, different uh, legal forms, which uh, then would give, um, would give room and, uh, um, let us say, they, they gave the possibility for social enterprises to develop and to evolve. Because more than anything else, social enterprise is a, is a story of an evolution, of a, an organization and legal evolution. And what are these legal forms? These legal forms are foundations, and we probably all know, we are all familiar with this notion, whether, whether you are in Australia or in the uh, United Kingdom or in Italy or in Spain or any, any other country, because foundations are assets geared to the accomplishment of a certain public goal, of course, according to each country's legal system. Then we have associations. Um, here again, I think we're all familiar with this definition, which in, instead of having assets, they have persons, they have people who share the same values, the same principle, and they get together to pursue that goal, and that uh, social aim. And what are the common features of these two main legal forms which, uh, let's say, define what we would call the non-profit sector, the third sector? The non-distribution constraint, which still today in most countries is the most distinguishing feature of non-profit organizations, and traditionally, up to recent times, a non-economic approach. These are the characters of non-profit organizations in Europe. And at a certain stage, though, uh, public authorities and the community at large started to be interested in non-profit organizations more than in the past. Why? Because they started to supply welfare services, they started to create new jobs, and particularly they started to um, carry out projects and activities aimed to integrate disabled people, people with disabilities, into work. And last but not least, because they, they would be able to involve a wide range of stakeholders. Now, exactly on these characters, uh, social enterprises developed because the main legal consequence of the, let us say, of this evolution, of the evolution we are dealing with, is that foundations and associations started to move, move away from their main advocacy and mutual benefit uh, character to move to, to become or to change into entrepreneurial organizations. And this is why, and this is how, social enterprises, I would say in most countries in Europe, I remember I took part in a, probably the first EU-funded research project concerning social enterprises back in 1996, 1997, when I used to teach in Trento, in the northern parts of Italy. And so the consequence or the characters that we, we, we may find and we can find in social enterprises are the following. First of all, they remain private legal entities. They stem out of communities. They are not the outcome of any public authority's decision. So they are private legal entities. They are strongly and they are largely committed and engaged in producing, in supplying, in delivering 
welfare services, including healthcare and social care services, they present a multi-stakeholder organization, which means that, as we shall see for the Italian case, they must include in their membership users, workers, beneficiaries, even private companies, or to some extent, even public authorities. And so they, they are based or on democratic uh, governance. So there's no, <clears throat> there's no capital sharing, so to say. So the principle on which social enterprises is based is one head, one vote, which is the typical principle defining the mutual and cooperative movement around the world. And a last word uh, <clears throat> is worth mentioning concerning the role of the non-distribution constraint, because social enterprises may be not defined by a total non-distribution constraint, i.e., for those who are not familiar with this definition, the non-distribution constraint is the prohibition for non-profit organizations to distribute profits, not to make profits, but to distribute them among members of boards of directors, among members, among partners, among stakeholders. In social enterprises, in some countries, of course, depending on the legal um, framework, of each country's legal system, this non-distribution constraint may be relaxed, meaning that members may, uh, or let's say social enterprises may distribute profits, but to a certain extent, which is really limited. Now, as to the enabling legal framework, we have to turn our attention now, if this picture is clear to you, to understanding how the European Union has contributed to the development of social enterprises. And uh, first of all, for those who are not familiar with the European Union law, uh, let me just remind all of us that um, member states are or detain, retain all powers in terms of organizing uh, managing and delivering social and healthcare services, and they also have the power, uh, the unique power, to rule all the legal forms. Nonetheless, over the years, the European Union, particularly in the, in the area of non-profit organizations, of NGOs, and in the area of healthcare services, has developed a kind of coordination and uh, stimulating, so to say, power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, member states. And one of these initiatives that I would like to uh, refer to is an initiative taken by the European Commission back in 2011, nine years ago. Because the European Commission, through this communication, um, underlined the importance of the crucial role of social enterprises in creating, in creating or in developing social economy and innovation. So there you are. Social enterprises are regarded as important legal forms to promote, to develop social economy and innovation. So we could say that uh, like many other companies, many other legal forms, social enterprises are no longer regarded as minor, minor organizations, so to say. But they are, um, they are placed in, in the whole social economy context to be used, to be exploited, if I may say so, to, um, to promote social development and social cohesion. Therefore, um, the European Union has enhanced the economic dimension of nonprofit organizations, which is the, uh, the real new character of these organizations compared to the past, compared to what used to be um, the, the role of foundations and associations, as I mentioned before. So the economic dimension 
of, inter of non-profit organizations has been recognized. This initiative, social, social enterprise initiative, also uh, gave member states uh, not, not the power, but at least they were recommended to take action in favor of social enterprises. And that is what the, Europe, the Italian uh, parliament did, and to which we turn attention in a few minutes. But also, and I would like to draw your attention to this particular aspect, not only have social enterprises been promoted in, in general terms, but the European Union also favors uh, the development of social enterprises as far as public procurement is concerned, meaning that social enterprises are, are regarded exactly because of their peculiar characters, social aim, democratic governance, uh, non-distribution constraints, to be kinds of preferred legal forms to be awarded contracts in the health and social care sector. And also, the working conditions, or let us say the personal characters of people uh, who might work for social enterprises, are carefully taken into consideration by the European Union, i.e., in the European context, we have a directive which was enacted in 2014, number 24, which is a very important directive, which was to be implemented and ratified, so to say, and incorporated in all uh, member states' legal systems. And this directive has a special favor for uh, small and medium enterprises, which is the legal definition under which social enterprises are included. Secondly, there is an article, Article 20, which reserve contracts to social enterprises that, uh, whose aim is to integrate people with disabilities into the labor market, into their own organization and into the labor market. But there is a third important uh, provision, which is represented by Article 77 of this directive, that reserves contracts for certain services to some organizations only. And these organizations, given their characters, are exactly what we term social enterprises, because they need to pursue a social aim. They need to present a democratic governance, therefore, and they need to have a multi-stakeholder, um, let us say, organization. So these two, um, let us say, act or anyway, uh, documents, legal documents, the first back in 2011 and the directive, which is a legislative act uh, in uh, terms of the European law, have helped social enterprises to develop. They, they definitely helped social enterprises to become what they are. Um, and particularly, they help social enterprises in delivering health care services, like the title of this seminar refers to. But why social enterprises are so much recognized, or at least they are considered to be preferred legal forms to deliver, supply, and organize health care services? because within the European context, this, uh, these, uh, these enterprises help ensure the right to health. Mind you that the right to health, for those who are not familiar with the European legal context, is enshrined in a, in a, in a number of constitutional laws, particularly or especially in the Italian law, section 32 of our constitution, provides for the right to health. But the right to health could not be ensured without the support, the activities of non-profit organizations 
including social enterprises. This is why both at the European level and in our case at the Italian level, social enterprises, activities and aims are enhanced and supported by uh, national legal systems. A second aspect which I would like you to, um, to bear in mind is that social enterprises, particularly when they are uh, incorporated under the legal form of limited liability companies, they may, op they may open up their membership also to uh, local health authorities. They may set up what we term, as you probably know, public-private partnerships, triple P, meaning that um, social enterprises may actually uh, welcome um, public authorities in their memberships. Therefore, they might represent an effective legal tool to make public authorities and private incentives come together in the same, uh, same organisation. Now, what about the Italian uh, case? Um, according, or let's say pursuant, to the European law, uh, to the European legal framework, in 2017, so really recently, uh, the Italian Parliament passed um, a comprehensive reform of the third sector organisations. And this comprehensive reform includes also the Social Enterprises Reform Act. This is an important act for what we are uh, tackling this morning. Because, first of all, this act empowers local health authorities to get social enterprises involved in the delivering of healthcare services. Mind you that, particularly, uh, social enterprises have developed, have evolved over the last few years in Italy, uh, especially because we've, uh, we are still facing, we have faced the, the migration flows. And social enterprises and NGOs are particularly uh, essential to deliver services to migrants, but not only to help them out in terms of, which is really important to rescue them at sea, but also to deliver healthcare services, to actually uh, provide healthcare services to migrants. This is just an example of what this Reform Act has provided for. But then there is a second aspect, which I think could be or might be of some interest to you, which is quite a, 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 a new piece of information, a new way of understanding the delivering of services, at least uh, in Italy. Not that it's, it was exactly new, it was not totally new. But this Reform Act, this 2000, um, uh, 2017 Reform Act, helped to, has helped to enhance this approach, which is the possibility for both public authorities and social enterprises of co-programming and co-providing healthcare services. Um, traditionally, or in general terms, social enterprises, non-profit organizations, would be called upon only as ultimate providers um, at the end of what? At the end of a public procurement procedure. Here we have something different. We do not have competition procedures, so to say, but we have cooperation, partnership, collaboration between public authorities and social enterprises. Public authorities are no longer in the position of knowing in advance and beforehand everything which is needed to be done in terms of matching social and health care needs. Therefore, they call upon social enterprises to cooperate with public authorities themselves in order to define, to depict, to design the most adequate projects and activities to match those needs. 
But in, in doing this, social enterprises must prove a democratic governance model, as I said before, which is one of the most distinctive characters of these organizations. There is instead, in this case, um, there, is a, there is something new, totally new in this Reform Act, which is the, um, let's just say, uh, the social impact model that social enterprises are subject to, meaning that public authorities ask social enterprises to go through a social impact uh, process of assessment. And this might represent, we're just at the beginning of this process, we haven't developed yet a rob robust and solid, and let's say uh, a consolidated experience in this field, but the first experiences tell us that this might represent an important and valuable uh, system to assess social enterprises' activities and aims. Then, once again, I would like to remind you and to stress that Social Enterprises Reform Act of 2017 allows social enterprises to distribute profit to a certain extent, let's say up to a limited cap, which is really small, but there is this possibility. And the entrepreneurial nature of social enterprises is safeguarded, is protected, even if the membership of social enterprises is open up to public authorities and to private companies. So these two, these two um, let's just say, um, organizations, public authorities and private organizations cannot take control over social enterprises uh, membership. This means that social enterprises may have public authorities and private for-profit organizations as partners in their own membership, but social enterprises must remain genuine, so to say. They cannot be taken over either by public authorities or by private organizations. So in the end, what can we uh, make of both the European uh, Union context and of the uh, Italian Social Enterprises Reform Act? Both European law, EU law, and the Italian uh, reform, Social Enterprises Reform Act favor the development of social enterprises and nudges their performances, particularly as a economic and social operators. I would like to stress this point. It is not just a matter of volunteers. It is not just a matter of voluntary organizations or charitable organizations, but the, the economic dimension of these organizations is particularly enhanced and promoted. Also, these organizations are called, are engaged heavily in the delivery of healthcare services in cooperation, in partnership with public author uh, authorities. And also I think the social enterprises um, experience both in the EU and in Italy may actually stand a closer comparison with other different jurisdictions. I'm just thinking about the Australia one as I try to um, uh, to prove in, uh, in the article I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, of, of, this, uh, <clears throat> of this lecture, of this seminar. So, some concluding remarks. Uh, I hope I, I, let's say, managed to show you the importance of enabling legal frameworks, first of all. Secondly, the importance of recognizing the peculiar characters of legal forms, because it is not like that in all the world, all around the world. I'm just thinking of the United States uh, system, for instance, as you probably know, they, with the corporate, with the legal form of corporation, you, you can do anything. And as long as that corporation includes the nonprofit distribution constraint, then it can be, rec it is recognized 
as tax-exempted organization. Uh, the importance of connecting economic activities to the accomplishing of general interest. It was not like that in the past. Mind you that in Italy, according to our civil code, which dates back to 1942, uh, the, the economic activities was, uh, uh, were prohibited, kind of. I mean, non-profit organization would be only um, based on volunteers and based on non-economic activities. Whereas here we have a, a, the last lesson uh, that, that we can learn, that the non-distribution constraint has uh, progressively lost its, uh, its crucial importance. Because what is more important than the non-distribution constraints is the social aim to which all activities must be geared and must be, um, let's just say, must be connected in order to provide services which are to ensure individuals' fundamental rights, including the right to health. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll leave the floor to Francesco. Thank you, Chester. Very, very intriguing and uh, interesting. Um, I received uh, uh, common messages, direct messages, so I'm doing, I'm going to do my best to go uh, through them. Uh, well, the first one, I think it's uh, indeed, um, uh, by the way, I'll just say, I don't know if you noticed that I tribute uh, the Dolomites uh, uh, in the back I, uh, for, I, for, your, for you. Of course I did. Yeah, very good. Uh, uh, so the first question is uh, related to the definition of economic activity. I think it's a very good question. Um, and, uh, well, I'll put some of my own uh, uh, reading of it because it's rather long. So I hope I go make good uh, sort of a, a tribute to the to the, the person demanding this. But um basically uh, if if it, if there is an economic activity um uh, that might be susceptible of other european um uh laws including competition which might uh, then open up and expose these um enterprises to uh, a number of of uh, uh, uh you know the challenges in terms of uh, for example capitalization competing with other uh, for profit firms and so on um, obviously, that has been, in my knowledge, so uh, one of the of the avenues that that, that uh, you know sort of uh, threatened a, a little bit some um, uh, healthcare uh, sectors or markets uh, in in some countries. Do, do you have a comment on that? Sure, um, you, you you did well in uh, in stressing the fact that the European Union internal rule um, is important for social enterprises too. And this is why the European Union law uh, has uh, provided for an exception to that rule. Social enterprises remain enterprises, and exactly because of their goals, Directive 2014, number 24, has provided for their recognition to be awarded contracts within not the internal market rule only, but within the cooperation framework, meaning that public authorities are authorized to decide how and to what extent to manage and to organize healthcare services. As you, as you know, this is a competence, this is a power which falls uh, under the member states' uh, powers, okay? So these are authorized to say, okay, we want to organize to provide to supply a healthcare service do we need to go for the market or can we decide to call upon some enterprises which are def defined by some characters which we recognize as beneficial to local communities to people particularly for to the most vulnerable groups of society and therefore we ask them to be our partners so economic activity is maintained, is safeguarded, so to say, is protected. And at the same time, these enterprises uh, are, are become partners of public authorities. And I, let you, I, I would like to uh, make a further comment, a really short one. Um, I, I did not mention that because it, it is more complicated than, than probably we might think of. But the whole reform in Italy the whole Social Enterprises uh, Reform Act is based 
on the authorization that has to be given by the European Commission. Authorization concerning what? Concerning tax benefits. Because social enterprises are defined by a, a wide range of tax benefits, but until the European Commission uh, does not say that these tax benefits are consistent with the European Union law concerning state aid, unfortunately, this reform uh, will be, let us say, it's like a, a, a lame duck, okay? <laughs> Just to use a, an expression which is uh, used in the United States for the presidency. Um, because without tax benefits, uh, social enterprises might not you know, take off, so to say, but the, the, the whole legal framework is in place. So we are, need, we are waiting for this authorization to be granted, but we don't know when. And probably these days will be difficult, that uh, European Union. Yeah, I think that there are actually um, uh, two related questions. One uh, from Matthew, thank you for um, uh, actually having your name uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the login. Um, so I think the question can be uh, uh, summarized by, uh, actually no, but can be read. Is there any EU or Italian policy thinking on why we continue to care about the non-distribution constraint, even if uh, we relax it in some cases? I think um, that that is a question that I also had in mind, because in fact, uh, um, a lot of what's happening in healthcare uh, is still debated in a dichotomy by private public. Uh, even now with COVID, you've seen um, even uh, in uh, the New York Times and other uh, media uh, recently that the Lombardy model has been um, uh, criticized heavily um, uh, because it's fundamentally run by private ent entities or, or the like. So I think this question touches upon a very important contemporary issue, which uh, is, is pointing indeed to the non-distribution con constraint and then he continues, uh, Matthew, if the objective is to maximize community benefit, uh, then we should be unconcerned about the means by which that benefit is generated. Uh, For-profit companies might uh, generate more community benefit than many charities do. So it seems that the non-distribution constraint uh, reflects uh, 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 a policy objective to maintain and preserve particular ways of generating community benefit, perhaps ways that are distinctively altruistic that, that is a very interesting, uh, elaborate uh, question. Yeah, I, I would like to get back to Matthew's question just with, with a short comment. Um, in Italy, uh, since 2015, if I remember rightly, uh, there is the possibility for for-profit companies to become what you know, because it comes from the US-based system, benefit corporations. And these corporations are ordinary corporations that by law must devote some of their profits to community uh, interest uh, and community development. So Matthew's, uh, uh, Matthew's question is absolutely you know, spot on. Uh, what, what I can uh, react to that is that in the European Union and in Italy too, uh, there has, there's always been a kind of um, difficulty, if I may use this word, in approaching um, the, the production of services without them being produced and supplied by non-profit organizations. In other words, uh, perhaps there is also a political and ideological bias in terms of uh, realizing that for profits can actually provide uh, services and, and to supply healthcare services in a, let us say, inverted commas, uh, let us say, social social way. Um, I agree with you, Francesco, and probably if I got the uh, got Matthew's question right, um, I also agree with you that the non-distribution constraints, like in many cooperatives, uh, cooperative societies, may hinder the development, the capitalization of these organizations. But of course, this is another another matter. But this. This is why I think social enterprises are actually a, an, ob, an object of comparison. And I think we could launch this as a you know, kind of uh, area in which to uh, investigate and to analyze also from different disciplines. 
Yeah, um, I agree. It's interesting. Uh, now, uh, uh, thanks to Abdul um, Latif um, for the question. Uh, if uh, a social enterprises must prove a democratic governance system to get contracts, how then can how then can they reduce inter interference or influence from state governments in the um, uh, pursue uh, in their pursuit of health related uh, social missions? Right. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to say that uh, probably you know I didn't have the time to. Um, clarify this point. Uh, a multi-stakeholder governance uh, uh, system is no easy task. Uh, personally, if you, if you want my personal impression and opinion, I don't think that many social enterprises will develop, um, um, let's just say, uh, in this perspective, because it is really difficult to engage users, workers, beneficiaries and other stakeholders um, particularly if you if you take notice of the fact that the law the act um, 2017 provides for the obligation of social enterprises that have a certain number of workers that these workers also elect that their own representatives on the board of directors so because social enterprises model is based on the german co-management model, okay? But this is not an easy task, of course, to accomplish. Um, I would not say that the multi-stakeholder organization by itself um, may be subject to interferences um, by public authorities. Rather, I think that public authorities uh, or the, the, the act provided for this multi-stakeholder um, organization exactly because uh, the act wants these enterprises to be uh, community based so th they want to be they want social or the act wants social enterprises to be rooted in social community in, in local communities so that these may have their own say within the the, the membership yeah, so now um, let me ask you a question like uh, the economist in me couldn't resist um, um, and uh, <laughs> I have to ask it. Uh, so for me, this is a very interesting concept and um, um, I think that the legal uh, nature um, or basis um, that, 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 you know, you, you, or let's say if you think of the spectrum of legal entities that you can imagine operating in the Italian, European, international context, and without trivializing any of the fundamental elements, of course, there are some that are more important than others. Clearly, uh, you outlined uh, um, a number of those. Uh, one, uh, um, uh, there are two, two parts uh, in my question. The first one is, uh, does it really matter um, and, uh, uh, for healthcare? Um, and this is a question that economists have tried to look at uh, by by comparing for profit and not for profit, right? So social enterprises kind of sit in between. You describe the situation of, of grayness that might actually uh, uh, find the balance because what you found, in fact, is that uh, especially in ca so that's the first part, the the, the nature of the the, the 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 organizations operating, and then the environment. So uh, they they both need to be taken into account. So whether you have competition or not, uh, it's uh, probably the most simple way of describing it. So assuming that you have a competitive environment, uh, whether you're for profit or not for profit, it doesn't really matter. Uh, they maximize profits, both of them. The only difference is the re redistribution or distribution of those. And, uh, uh, and, and in, in that uh, respect, uh, of course, uh, you know, there are, you know, on top of philosophical questions, also purely fiscal policy questions, right? Because you might obtain the same gains in taxing uh, the profits of, uh, you know, a, a purely for-profit organization as, you know, detaxing not-for-profit or capping the distribution at a certain point. So uh, what, what, what can, so I, I like this concept because it seems to try to bring together and respond to the fact that the, the, the healthcare space is becoming more competitive. And at the same time, it, it tries to sort of eat two birds with one stone, right? So 
um, uh, by creating this, this blurriness or, or gray area uh, where you have this, this public-private partnership. Of course, you know, the jury is out there, so it's more a comment actually than a question, but it also has, it, it also has questions in, hidden in there. So please, I'll just, sure. that, that is all I have and, and uh, fascinating, um, but I, I have to get my, my head around the, these two dimensions and how they interplay. Absolutely, Francesco, thanks. Um, we, we have to add that the 2017 Act provides for a positive list of general interest activities which are reserved to social enterprises. So it's like saying, if I, if I follow your reasoning, which I really find, <laughs> find really interesting and fascinating, um, it is like having a, a broad picture in which you have on the one side the competitive market um, on which you have for-profit organizations, for-profit companies to, to compete and to go for public tenders. And on the other side, you have social enterprises, meaning that social enterprises can only be called upon to provide those activities, to supply those services which are listed in the Act. But of course, as you say, the, there will be a time in which these two, uh, let's just say, markets will, will be combined together. Um, also because, um, as you said, there is, a, there is a big question concerning tax benefits. So today, to, uh, to be true, there is no incentive in mm. setting up a social enterprise. Um, there's no um, tax incentive, I mean, okay? Social enterprises might be useful for those non-profit organizations which are incorporated under the legal forms of foundation associations and the boards or directors want to maintain their, their genuine forms and they use a, a kind of spin-off social enterprise to provide to carry out economic activities so that they can be kind of, you know, clean environments in which they work so they can maintain the, the, associate, the association nature and at the same time they can provide for healthcare services. Last but not least, as you well know from the European and Italian experience, we also have, as Matthew jotted down in the chat, we also have the, uh, to bear in mind, the institutional framework, Francesco. And in our context, in the Italian context, whether you are for profit or non-profit, if you want to provide uh, healthcare services, you need to go through a licensing uh, system, the accreditation, as the Americans would call it. You know? So this is something which has to be added up to what we are talking about. But absolutely, I think we, are, we have not reached the final point. Yeah. This act opens up for new, for new developments. Yes, wonderful. Okay, thank you, Alchas. Let's go around uh, uh, before closing. Um, um, if uh, there are any questions, please... Uh, um, intervene and now or never. Beautiful. Okay, fantastic, Alcesta. This was uh, excellent. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, the recording uh, for those who uh, didn't make it will me will me will be made available on our uh, Value Health Economics and Policy Group website. Um, for those who joined for the first time and are interested in our activities, of course. Send us your contacts and uh, we'll keep you posted. It's a, a network, so it's no, nothing more than a hub to uh, keep us connected and uh, uh, join uh, and develop uh, joint uh, research ideas. Um, uh, I'll just say, uh, Professor Santuari, many, many thanks. Uh, keep Francesco, safe. Keep ne safe. Next time, Francesco and Matthew, next time in person in Australia. Yes, next time in person. <laughs> we can't wait to host you physically here. <laughs> I don't know where Matthew is, but uh, uh, right I'm in there, Melbourne. Of course. Ah, I, in Melbourne. I'll come to Bologna as soon as I can. All right, fantastic. This virus, got, Great. This virus got in the way, but exactly. We'll get there take care, here. Matthew. Thank you very <laughs> much right, again. Take care, everybody, and thanks for all those who attended. All the best. Okay, thanks, Francesco. Thank Keep you, in thank touch. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.